So in this lecture, we're going to talk about Salvador Dali. <laughs> and you'll understand this little quote, the association of delirious phenomena, um, hopefully a little bit once we go along. Um, this is Salvador Dali as a very young man on the left, and that's his friend Buniel. Um, <laughs> and you may notice if you look at pictures of photographs of Salvador Dali, um, even when he's older, he's still doing this little pose where he opens up his eyes really wide. Um, so one of the things about Salvador Dali is he kind of follows the creed like art is life, uh, and he lived in the same strange way, or at least tried to portray this, uh, that was in his art. So let's check it out. Um, so here's another portrait looking very dapper with his pencil thin mustache. Uh, so Salvador Dali survived into my lifetime, into 1989, and um, he said he wanted to make an art that is irrational, erotic, mad, and fashionable. He was certainly fashionable, but we'll talk about the irrational, erotic, and mad in a moment. Um, so Dali's life was so completely surrealist that his integrity and his pictorial accomplishment have been questioned most bitterly by other surrealists. What Arneson is talking about is that... Um, some artists who were surrealists uh, looked at Dali and they said, this guy, you know, we're making art and he's doing a performance. Um, for him, though, for Dali, um, his kind of performance of his life was part of the art. Um, so that's kind of what um, Arneson is talking about, that his life was so completely surrealist. Uh, so other people thought this was kind of like a, you know, annoying quality of Dali. Um, Another annoying quality might be that he became much more famous than the rest of them. So he's born at Figueres uh, near Barcelona. Um, and the landscape of his youth, which is similar to what we saw um, in Picasso's landscape, is put into his painting. So a lot of times he would start out painting by painting just a landscape, uh, like a beach or something like that from where he was from, this kind of like dry landscape. And then later he would populate it with images that came from visions or dreams or other things that he tried to get to. Uh, so he was interested in Freud, uh, as the other surrealists were too, this idea that we have unconscious needs and desires and they can be expressed through dreams or through meditation or through other means like that. Um, so one of his influences is is and when you see this picture right away, like if I told you this was a Dali picture, you probably thought, hmm, yeah, that would make sense. Uh, so you can see the influence with Giorgio de Chirico. Um, <laughs> as you can see from the titles that de Chirico has, The Anguish of Departure, um, that there is a somewhat disturbing kind of undercurrent to his work. Um, de Chirico called these his metaphysical landscapes. So in other words, man, landscapes that are talking about the meaning of existence. Uh, so pretty heavy stuff. Um, but sometimes if I looked at when I show classes this picture, I say, well, what do you think of this picture? Like, do you think there's something off about it? A lot of times people say that, yeah, the, the people are really small and they look like shadow people. The, the shadows are very long. Um, there's something just like kind of strange and empty about these landscapes. Um, and I think that's what Dali was seeing in it. He's like, yeah, I can kind of populate this emptiness with my unconscious desires. Um, so <laughs> I don't recommend it, but he had a pet ocelot. Like, don't don't make wild animals your pets. But Dali is doing in this, and you see he's doing his little pose in the picture. So like every other artist, that we talked about during this time period, 1929, he moves to Paris. Uh, he could speak French, which was convenient. He met some of the surrealists. Um, Andre Breton um, wrote, and this is the time of the class where everybody's writing manifestos, wrote the Surrealist Manifesto in 1924. He says, psychic automatism and its pure state by which one proposes to express verbally by means of the written word or any other manner, the actual functioning of thought dictated by thought in the absence of any control exercised by reason exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern. Um, so basically what the surrealists wanted to do was get access to this kind of what they saw as um, the real person that's covered up by um, expectations of society or um, exposure to previous arts. Um, so to them, poetry was the most surrealist thing you can do because with poetry, because um, humans are really good with words, you can basically 
take words and spill them right out onto the paper. Um, a lot of people thought that making art, like visual art, with this idea of surrealism was impossible because with visual art, you have to take time to make it. Um, so visual artists kind of got around that by trying to do things that you had this automatic effect, um, but um, then you could go back to it later and make it permanent. Uh, so with Jean Arp, um, objects arranged according to the laws of chance. Like how he did this is he would, he had many different methods, but one method was he would take some construction paper and hold it over a piece of um, cardboard or something like that. And he would just like close his eyes and take some scissors and just start cutting it. And then just let the pieces fall. And wherever they fell, then he would create it in a permanent fashion. So in this one, um, he made it into wood. So that's kind of how they got around the deliberation that's required to make art. But Dali um, wanted to do it in a little bit of a different way. He didn't want, he didn't want to make these kind of like abstract ideas. Uh, instead, he wanted to make what was abstract of sorts, like dreams and such, and make them into something that you could hold on to and that you could sort of recognize. Uh, so he came up with this idea. He had lots of interesting ideas. Uh, one was a paranoid critical method. He says, the creation of a visionary reality from elements of visions, dreams, memories, and psychological or pathological distortions. Uh, so to Dali, some of the things, like if you've ever had a dream that was disturbing and you might think, well, how is my mind doing that? Um, or, you know, was daydreaming and came up with some disturbing imagery. Uh, to him, these things that seem um, maybe even like a sign of mental illness or something like that, to him, uh, were saying something about humans and that we should try to put that out there. Um, so he kind of called his paintings dream photographs. So they're things that appear through his, out his head, and he tried to make it in a way that, that we as viewers could see it. Um, and he looked at his work as a continuous frenzy of induced paranoia. Uh, so in other words, he took some of these thoughts that a lot of people um, perceive to be negative thoughts that some people have about others. People are out get to get me or uh, exploit me or whatnot. Sometimes these things are true. Um, but he took those and just went with them and see what would happen with them. So that's why he's talking about this induced paranoia. Um, he said that the main subjects of his work were blood, decay, and excrement. Um, so if that sounds kind of gross, uh, it is, and he's aware of that. But um, again, coming from Freud, um, the most basic of human functions are seen to be driving the way that humans work sometimes. So I'm going to include a link. Um, to this movie, uh, Anchien Andalou, which means an Andalusian dog. Um, and I'll say a couple things about it first. Uh, when you see this, if you want to watch the movie, you don't have to, but if you want to watch it, when you see the screenshot that, um, when you see the scene that is in the screenshot, um, if you are like disturbed um, by like kind of a graphic violent thing, then look away <laughs> or fast forward the video because trust me, you don't want to see it. And you're probably thinking, it's 1929. How bad it could it be? It's really bad. Um, and when in, I show it in class, I ask students to look away and then some students don't believe me and then you look at it anyway and there's a big gasp. So look away if there's this things that disturb you. The other thing I'll say is like um, at the end of it, when I show it in class, students will often be like, what does it mean? Which is ironic because beforehand I say, you can't figure out what it means. <laughs> um, and that's kind of intentional. Uh, so Dali is kind of like doing like a brain dump with this and along with Louis Buniel. He's just taking the things that are in his head. If they mean something, it's almost coincidental. He just wants to put the images out there to see what happens. In some way, this, is, this movie is more effective than his paintings and doing what he wants to do, make dream photographs. In this case, it's dream movies. So you'll probably think there's all this stuff that's going on and I don't understand. But then think of your dreams. If you've ever had a dream where you're in one place and then suddenly you're in another place, like you're one person and suddenly you're another person and the person in front of you changes into another person. Um, he just wanted to put that straight out there. Um, so the other thing I would say about the movie too is that there's some violence, there's some nudity. If that's something that bothers you, uh, then you don't have to watch it. 
So this one, Accommodations of Desire, he's using both painting. Um, he's got this landscape, which he painted first, uh, and some collage. If this looks like it's from a kid's book with lines in it, that's because that's what it's from. He cut it out. Uh, and this one's called Accommodations of Desire. And this is his kind of uh, look at the femme fatale or Madonna whore type thing. Uh, he became really interested in this woman who's a fascinating person, Gala. Um, and he felt that he wasn't very cool. Like Dolly was kind of weird. So, he, you know, he didn't really think that he was cool or anyone interesting would also be interested in him. Uh, so he's a little intimidated by Gala. Um, and he kind of like transferred to that into things like lions, you know, she could take his head off. Uh, and we can see right here, he's kind of playing on Monk, an artist we didn't talk about, but you can look him up. Um, and we have the female figure and Dali, uh, and he's like kind of biting the hand, <laughs> maybe biting the hand that feeds him, uh, and the lion right here, and then all of these egg like forms. So, um, this was during the time that he first met Gala and he was trying to um, date her. Uh, eventually he would just, it would be, Gala would be his like soulmate for lack of a better word, his partner throughout his life. So the desires were always represented by the terrorizing images of lying his heads. So if he was really attracted to someone uh, and he thought they were interesting, he was also afraid of them at the same time. Uh, so this is his most famous painting in some ways. Uh, but, and if you're trying to look for a deep meaning for it, it's not necessarily there. Uh, he's kind of doing the same thing that he does with those pictures. So with this particular picture, he painted the background. So the water and everything, and you see it's really realistic the way he paints it. And then he just leaves it um, until he thinks of images to put in there. Um, so he had a bunch of different ways of doing that. Um, one of the ways that he would do it is, uh, and I've kind of experienced this myself, you may notice like if you're in the afternoon and you need to take a nap um, and, or you're just very tired and you're kind of like your mind is wandering, um, you might start to kind of like see things or almost have like a dream um, when you're barely asleep and barely awake. Um, and a lot of times people do that. They'll nod off and they have dreams immediately and wake up and remember them. They're very interesting. Uh, so he would like bring this method about, uh, like for instance, he would go to take a nap in the afternoon. He's living in France and he used to live in Spain. So that's the thing that people do. Uh, and he wanted to remember the dreams he had though. So what he would do is uh, he would sit down in a chair to take a nap and he would hold some keys in his hand and underneath his hand, he would have a plate. So basically what would happen is he would nod off, drop the keys, that would wake him up, and then whatever appeared before him, he would try to make a drawing and then try to put it in the canvas. With this one, though, he was um, inspired by a party. He says, there's nothing more than soft, extravagant, solitary, paranoid, critical, camembert teas of space and time. Um, so with this one, oh, and by the way, if you watch a movie, you may have recognized the ants. I guess it's kind of gross. Uh, so what happened is Dali had a party um, with some of his friends at his apartment in Paris, and he had already finished the background for the painting, so he was just waiting to put stuff in it. Um, and it's a party in Paris, so there was cheese and wine. Um, and everybody has fun and, and eats some, some cheese. And then he went back into the kitchen, and he saw the cheese had gotten kind of soft and was streaming out. Um, so he had an idea to take some of the images that he had already been using, you can see them in the movie, uh, and kind of make them into this cheese. Uh, and it gives you that kind of strange effect. Um, so if you're looking into more meaning than that, um, it's, not it's not something that Dali intended, but um, he certainly wouldn't have a problem with you analyzing the meaning and trying to understand something about him. So this picture, um, <laughs> it's got quite a name. Gala and the Angelus of Millet before the imminent arrival of the conical anamorphoses. Uh, if you're not aware, anamorphoses is basically a way of um, creating a very realistic three-dimensional effect in a picture. Uh, so when you see this picture, you're probably like, wow, this looks really real, except I would never want to be in this reality because it's disturbing as hell. Uh, that's true. So he has a couple of things going on in here. Um, first off, this figure right here is Lenin. Uh, so Lenin was the leader of the, one of the leaders, <laughs> the one that won in the Russian Revolution in 1917. Uh, and he had died um, 
1926, so years before this painting was made. Uh, but he was seen throughout the world as kind of like this um, inspiring figure. Uh, and many people, um, socialism at that time was positively thought of like pretty much universally by everybody except rich people. So a lot of people saw Lenin as inspiring. But already by this time in 1933, they had also kind of seen the, some of the downsides to the authoritarian part of his revolution. Um, so expressing that a little bit with this arm that's dying, perhaps. And then he has Gala uh, in, the, in the background. Um, the figure he has right here, um, I'll explain in a moment. Um, that's actually somebody. But this painting up here is a painting he owned. It's by Millet, and it's called Angelus. Uh, and how most people see this painting is they look at it and say, this is kind of like a classic scene. Um, these are two people who work really hard um, and they're coming together in marriage. Uh, and Millet is kind of putting these symbols, like it's basically promises. Like um, the man is saying, okay, I promise to work in the fields and they have his tool here. And um, the woman says, I promise to work at home. Uh, and to provide in that way. So um, Millet is trying to show it as this almost like universal kind of romantic um, type of pairing. Whereas the way that Dali saw it, and remember he owned this painting, uh, is that it represented predatory female sexuality. Uh, for him, um, the basket, instead of representing the bread and the children that, um, that the woman would have, um, it represented her sexuality uh, and that she would only give it up um, if the man uh, did work for it. Uh, so to him, he saw this in like a rather negative light. Uh, so as far as this dude right here, uh, it's Maxim Gorky. Uh, and he was um, during the, before the revolution in, in Russia and afterwards, he was a really popular writer. Um, people really liked that he portrayed regular Russian people and the things that they were concerned with. Um, so he was really popular. And um, Lenin wasn't a big fan of him, but uh, he didn't really mess with him. Uh, but Stalin, um, who replaced Lenin in 1926, uh, was a bit more, more paranoid than Lenin and certainly more controlling. Um, and... Maxim had written some things that Stalin thought were critical of him personally. Uh, so he said to Maxim, um, hey, I have an idea. You can change the stuff you wrote. Here's what you're going to write. Um, or I could kill you. <laughs> um, and <laughs> Maxim was like, okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> so he left Russia, he escaped, uh, and then eventually he came back. Um, because Stalin, when you escape, that's not good enough for him. Um, he'll literally follow you around the world uh, to if you if he felt that you wronged you. Like he was really petty like that. Um, so he had basically sent his agents out wherever Maxim Gorky was uh, to assassinate him. Uh, and Maxim Gorky was aware of this, um, so Stalin put a contact out to Gorky and said, "Okay, you can come back to Russia, um, and of course you're going to write." what I want. Um, and I also give you a house for you and your wife and um, another house for you and your mistress. And I'll provide you a couple of other mistresses and then we're good. <laughs> so that's what Corky did. He goes back uh, and he decides that this is a good deal and he does what Stalin wants. Uh, so <laughs> Dali puts a lobster on his head uh, and also makes him look like he's kind of withering away. Um, like Lenin, so kind of showing how the revolution had withered through time. As far as the lobster, I wouldn't say he has like a Jordan Peterson view of lobsters, but he does have interesting views about crustaceans. Um, so it's not really important to understand them, but just that he loves kind of putting crustaceans in his pictures. So this last one is about something serious. So usually Dali... Um, would say my work doesn't have meaning. With this one, he's definitely going for meaning. Uh, it says, soft construction with boiled beans, premonitions of civil war in 1936. So this was right before the civil war started, but everyone knew that it was gonna start. 
Um, so the Spanish Civil War lasted from 1936 to 1939. And for Europeans and for kind of the battle between capitalism and socialism, um, this was a watershed moment. Um, so one of the reasons why they knew that a civil war was coming up is um, by this time in Germany, the Nazis uh, had gained power and they wanted to support other fascists. Um, so one of the other fascists was Franco in Spain. And um, a lot of people with power in Spain, like the old nobility uh, and the capitalists, they kind of went along with the fascists, even though they weren't, they didn't necessarily like what the fascists were doing because the fascists were interested in basically keeping the balance of power uh, that kept them in charge, more or less. So that happened in Nazi Germany and in Italy. Like in Italy, um, Mussolini said that fascism is the marriage of capital and the state. Um, so, um, so people with power were interested in Franco and, and people in the church actually supported him despite him being a fascist. Um, almost because he was a fascist in a way because he was willing to be ruthless to keep them in power. Uh, but at this time in Spain, there were also uh, communists that were supported by uh, Stalin. Um, there were anarchists who are basically a different type of communist who were supported by themselves uh, and they created anarchist communities in Catalonia where they ran the places themselves and it worked really well. Um, and then there were people that were more like the liberals and conservatives that you would see in modern day America. Uh, so people who wanted to make some changes, but not too many changes. Um, and the battle between these various forces, uh, eventually the liberals realized the fascists weren't good and they had to fight them. Um, but by that time they had already um, kind of destroyed uh, their, their relationships with the anarchists and the communists. Um, so as a result, um, there wasn't really a united front against the fascists. The fascists had support of the Nazis uh, and the fascists won. But unlike the Nazis who were brought down by the end of World War II, uh, Franco continued to stay in power until 1974. So Spain was a fascist state uh, for decades afterwards. Um, so everybody saw this was coming. And they knew because of what they had already seen that the Nazis had done in other places and people that they supported, uh, that it was gonna be extremely violent. Um, so he's showing some scenes of violence. This uh, head is actually from a photograph that was taken um, in a previous war of a tank that had been destroyed and someone had placed the, the person who had burned inside of the tank, their head on top of the tank. Uh, so very gruesome. Um, but he shows like kind of this figure um, warping back on itself. So the symbol of civil war of people who are basically family in a way fighting themselves uh, and then it being squeezed out beans. Uh, he, beans are, are his representation of shit. So basically this person is uh, kind of shitting and pissing themselves uh, in their self-destruction. Um, so a delirium of auto strangulation. So what's interesting is that Dali did not take sides. Uh, and if you know anything about fascism and taking sides, if you don't take sides against fascism, he took sides for fascism. Uh, and he fled Spain like a lot of other artists because he was worried, but he actually came back and supported Franco, who again is like Hitler and Mussolini um, later in his life. Uh, so um, if you're wondering why I stopped with Dali's work right here is because after this, he didn't really make anything new. He just kept making the same sorts of things um, through time. 